Oh, I still got some. Okay. And for the most part, I don't actually drink it while I'm up here. I just hold it. Security blanket? I don't know. Apparently. Keeps me from tipping over or something. During my formative years of watching Chris Best and Sam Miles, I don't think either one of them can break your teams without a cut. <laughs> like, <clears throat> I promise I wasn't trying to copy them. I just... All right. So it is so good to, to have our guest this morning. Man, God is has just been blessing us so much the what's this three weeks four weeks in a row now like the, the encouragement the, the weather got nicer and the, the floodgates opened so man praise the lord we're, we're excited all right well uh you want to be let's let's go ahead and get get ourselves prayed in and we'll get going this morning Father, we just come to you, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, God, for, for who you are, Lord, for what you're doing all over the face of this world, Lord, as we, as we get to see the folks from Living Faith, Nairobi, and Lord, we think about Christodos in India and Joseph in the Philippines and in the Middle Eastern Baptist Seminary there in, in Egypt and South Sudan, and Lord, what you're doing at MBT and Vietnam and kind of just all over this world, Lord. Even though we are in this Laodicean church age, God, we're we're coming to the end, and the harvest is it's becoming less and less. Lord, you're still moving, you're still working. God, you are not done. You haven't given up on your creation. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you didn't just leave us in our sin. God, you would have still been holy and righteous and just if you had just left us dead in our sin. But God, you you had grace and you had mercy. You sent your son to die on the cross in our place to pay the price for, for our debt. God, we can never thank you enough for that. And Lord, you didn't just leave us with that. And Father, you gave us your word. As Sarah talked about this morning, uh, we can live our lives having a relationship with you, but not really knowing you. Uh, being saved, being reconciled, but not knowing truly who you are and, and how you want us to live, what you want us to do. But God, that's by our choice because you've given us your word. And Lord, that is such an incredible gift that you've given us your word and your Holy Spirit so that we know everything pertaining to life and godliness. Lord, I, my prayer this morning is that we would not choose to remain ignorant. Lord, I look at my own life and I was the same way. For so long, I thought I knew the things that, that were important for the most part, I thought the things of the world were more important. God, I pray this morning that our heart would just be open, Lord, to just receive the, the truth of your word, Father, to take it in, or to learn and to grow from it. Father, that you would conform us to the image of It's up to you. God, I pray that you would take me out of the way, Lord, that, that through your Holy Spirit, you would just anoint my speech, Father. Bibles this morning. If you want to be turned into Romans chapter 10, we're, we're slowly working our way through the book of Romans. Thought we were going to be making a little more progress this morning than we are. Uh, I don't know. 
I still haven't lost the fascination of, I, I look at a passage and I say, okay, yeah, this here's where this kind of breaks out. Then I start putting the message together and then all of a sudden I realize, wait a minute, we're not going anywhere close to that. The Romans chapter 10 is in such a, an incredible passage and, and I'm so thankful that God lets us dive into this. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe this works out well. We're coming into the lazy days of summer. It's it's getting hot for us. It's getting 80. It's, we're, we're dying. Heat stroke. Because it's, it's 80. <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of whiny like that here. We're, we're spoiled. But, man, praise the Lord, the days are getting long. And, and uh, I don't know about y'all. Like, the long days are such a blessing, but it makes things hard because, like, 9.30 and it's, the sun's just going down and you think, okay, now it's time for dinner and wind down for a few hours. And really, since I get up at 5, 9.30, I, I should be going to bed. So it, it makes for short nights, long days. But I also start looking and there's, you know, here in Laramie, where we have 90 days that we can do anything. There's so many things on the to-do list, but those other, those other nine months of the year can't get done. And so the to-do list is so long. But the other thing that's happening is, man, summer's a busy time of ministry. I mean, we're talking about how we had the free fishing day last weekend and and now we're looking at two weeks from now, we've got the our next FOI event. The 4th of July is going to be coming right around the corner after that. The way things are going to break out this year, it's going to be another week. And then we've got Jubilee Days Rodeo. Um, also, side note, fair point, um, twice now it's been brought up like by folks outside of the church. Of, hey, are you guys doing anything for Jubilee Days? Are y'all going to have a float and a parade? Pray about an FOI float. We need to. We're going to do that though. That's going to that's going to have to come together fast. And um, but we might give the students an opportunity to participate in the parade. That's <laughs> another thing. Put anyway, long story short, there's a lot going on. And y'all, we've got to kind of, with all of that that's happening in ministry, we've got to guard ourselves against two temptations. You know, praise the Lord for all these ministry opportunities, and they're so exciting. But sometimes Satan can use that to actually pull us off track. The first thing that we have to be careful of is a lack of worship. Like, it is so easy to get overwhelmed with the busyness of the ministry that we lose the worship. And that has to be first and foremost. You know, we pick so much on poor Martha. Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And poor Martha, we, we just, I kind of feel sorry for her. I kind of feel bad about bringing her up all the time, but it's a great picture, y'all. Like Mary, Mary had the worship. When God was speaking, Mary was at his feet listening, at his feet worshiping. Martha, not that the work did not need to be done, but Martha was Martha didn't do the most important things first. It wasn't wrong that she was serving. What was wrong was she didn't do the most important thing first. She didn't worship first. And it's so easy when we get busy to say, oh, I've got to get this done. I've got to get that done. The deadlines are looming. Growing up in the South, I don't know why the, al the analogy always comes into my mind. The alligators are about to bite us on the butt. Like, it, it, and you're getting real focused on what's about to bite you on the butt. You're getting real focused on that deadline that's looming and all the stuff that has to be done. I know I live with a planner. <laughs> and I'm not picking on Jamie. She's 
praise the Lord because she's organized. I'm not. Sometimes I don't even think through the next thing that's coming. But it's so easy to get overwhelmed. So we've got to guard our worship. Paul, when he went to the Ephesian elders, was it? Yeah. The, man, yo, my brain's gone this morning. Paul calls the elders to him and he tells them, guard yourselves first. We have always got to, to guard ourselves and we've got to guard our worship in this busy time. But the other thing that we've got to be careful of, and it really goes hand in hand, it's, the two are, are, are tied so closely together, is that we have to be careful that we don't fall into works in the power of our flesh. And a lot of that is if we lose our worship, then it does become works. But we can slip into this, this almost panic. I have to get, we look at the to-do list, we start feeling overwhelmed, and rather than just desperately seeking God and allowing him to work through us, we start figuring out, okay, here's what I have to do. Here's what I have to do to get it done. And man, works are an easy thing to fall into. Especially, I, I think, in any church, but in a small church, a church plant where, where we hear, we hear so overwhelmed. We've got so much going on. Like FOI, I sound like a broken record, but and Chris Best described it so well. We have a ministry that is bigger than the church. We put our little group alongside, what, 100 and 30 something now. I mean, I can't even keep track. But praise the Lord, it's good and it, it's scary at the same time. I don't even know everyone in FOI anymore. That really bothers me. But it's grown so much in the last two months. I don't know all these new people. But works are an easy thing to fall into. And, and here's the other thing it's it's comforting to be able to point to something that that we are doing and to reassure ourselves that we're spiritual. We like, we like a checklist. Like that is, that's comfortable to be able to say, oh yeah, okay, I did that. Now I'm spiritual, now I'm good, now I'm pleasing God. But it's because of what I have done. But here's the problem, y'all, God isn't, God isn't interested in what we can do for him. Never forget. Last week, man, praise the Lord, we had Dave Shelby up here. Y'all got to hear some good preaching instead of me. One of the things Dave said, and it really struck with me because I'm seeing that in my own life. Dave said, you know, I, I hear, I've heard so many thousands of sermons. But there have been a few that have really just been a turning point in my life. And for me, one of those was, was a sermon, actually a series that Mark Trotter preached on the fallacy of living for God. And when I heard that title, I thought, how is it wrong to live for God? And as Mark, only Mark can do, Mark laid it out. Like, oh yeah, man, have I had that wrong? But God is not interested in what we can do for him. God is interested in what he can do through us. And God isn't impressed by our righteousness, which even after we're saved, our righteousness is still filthy rags. God didn't take our rags and wash them. God got rid of them. And clothed us with white robes, white linen, washed in the blood of Christ. But here's the thing. When we rely on our righteousness, we take off that beautiful, incredible white robe. And we go back and we put those filthy rags on again. And we parade them around like we're at some sort of a fashion show, strutting it, saying, hey, look at me. God is only interested in his righteousness that we receive through Christ. I'm talking about Mark Trotter in the 52 weeks of pursuit in the section on the book of Galatians. Mark Trotter put it this way. Mark says, 
Quite simply, our righteous standing before God isn't achieved, it is received. But unfortunately, there are, there are many Christians out there that are deceived into believing that after salvation by grace through faith, they somehow have to work to please God or, or to keep their salvation. And sadly, it's going to cost them rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. They're not going to lose their salvation, but they won't receive a full reward because rather than allowing God to work through them, they've chosen to try to work themselves. But, but as sad as that is, and as, as scary as that is, what is just absolutely heartbreaking is that there are many, many very spiritual, like, like y'all, they put us to shame, very spiritual, very religious, very zealous people out there that just completely pour themselves into and, and are faithful to a system of works. And they're relying on their good works for God in order to have eternal life. Instead of relying on Christ's shed blood on the cross, but no matter how hard they try, their good works can never be good enough. They can spend an, an entire lifetime trying to amount enough good works to pay off one single sin, and it will never be enough to satisfy God's righteousness, to satisfy the breach of God's holy standard. And this, this is the trap that Israel fell into corporately with the law. See, their, their heart was for their own glory. Their faith was no longer in God. They had stopped worshiping idols. So Israel comes into the land. They don't drive out all the inhabitants. They don't do what God said. And of course, they're, they're turned, their heart is turned to idol worship, to false gods. God, God breaks them. God takes them into captivity. It's hard. This is Hebrews chapter 12. This is the this is the woodshed. Praise the Lord for God's discipline because as hard as it is, it gets us to a place we need to be. But, but Israel put away the idols. After God brought them back to the land after 70 years of captivity, they don't worship idols anymore, but they swapped one thing for another. Anybody ever done that as a Christian? You overcome one sin in your life and you just pick up a different one? That's what Israel did. So they traded the idol worship for self-worship. Their faith was no longer in God, but in their ability to follow the law. And when the Son of God came with an offer of his sinless righteousness, they rejected that offer and and to this day, they still continue to rely on their own works to make them acceptable to God. So today, we're, we're going to start into Romans chapter 10. Uh, two weeks ago, we finished up Romans 9, the, the first of three chapters and three parts where, where Paul helps the Gentile church understand how Israel, which is God's chosen people, fit into the, the revolutionary changes that that happened when God began establishing not only the church, but, but doing that through mostly Gentile people. But in order for us to understand this and be able to, to put Israel into its proper perspective, Paul uses chapter 9 to, to teach about Israel's past. They give us the understanding that from God's perspective, it's only the faithful Jews that are Israel. And God is working through that group, that faithful group. But, <laughs> no, again, I sound like a broken record. I got to put this in there because it is so critical. Romans chapter 9, 
is an area where so many smart people, it's not that they're dumb, but they are deceived, get so fouled up. Romans chapter 9 is not about individual salvation. Romans chapter 9 is about corporate Israel as a people group. And the election is God electing, choosing through his foreknowledge, the nation of Israel, the, the Jewish people as a whole, the faithful ones that are following after him to serve him, to build eventually the physical kingdom. But it's not about God somehow in, in eternity past doing the doing the thing with the daisy and plucking it off and saying, heaven, hell, 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 heaven. It's not about that. So we always have to keep that in mind. But Paul uses uses nine to, to lay that foundation of Israel's past so that then we understand Israel's present and Israel's future in chapter 11. Where Israel is, is going to be restored. So today, <clears throat> we're going to hopefully get a better understanding of, of current events today by seeing Israel's rejection of Christ. And this is going to unfold in three parts. And unfortunately, I thought we were getting to all three, but we're not. Uh, but we're going to see what Israel has wrong. We're going to see what they're missing. And we're going to see like how that plays out, how that works. So first of all, this morning, what we're going to tackle is what Israel, I keep wanting to talk about it in the past tense, but it's present. Even though it was 2,000 years ago that they rejected Christ, they continue. That same rejection continues today, and that will continue until the end of the church age, until the church is raptured out, and God returns to dealing with the nation of Israel again. So we're going to talk about what Israel has wrong, present tense. And we're going to begin with the rejections after the cross. But first, we need to take a quick step back to the past, back to Romans 9 to see where this begins. In Romans 9, 31 through 32, as Paul was making this transition from, from Israel's past in, in 9 to Israel's present in 10, Paul said this in 31 and 32. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So pay attention to the verb tenses here. It's so cool. God is so much God. Paul is talking about the past. All of chapter 9 has been about the past. And he's describing Israel's past lack of faith, but their reliance on their own works that leads to a rejection that opened the door for the gospel to go directly to the Gentiles instead of going through Israel. When Christ comes, the offer is to Israel. And they reject it. They crucify their Messiah. But on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God honors the prayer of the Son. And even though they, they crucified and they killed their Messiah, God says, okay, we'll start this again. There's another chance. And again, this time through Peter, and the day of Pentecost, and and we see three rejections leading up to the stoning of Stephen. Israel has another chance to follow the righteousness of God rather than their own righteousness. And if they had accepted that, then God would have still worked through the nation of Israel to reach the Gentile nations. God wouldn't have just ignored the Gentiles, but God would have worked through Israel to reach them. But because Israel rejected, now the gospel goes directly to the Jews. 
or, I'm sorry, to the Gentiles. And that, that is the spiritual state of Israel as we transition into the church age, into the present, into chapter 10 this morning. Israel, they were like those folks that, that won't even consider anything different. Like, y'all ever run into that? Those ones that claim to, well, let's talk the one we've always done. Like, you mentioned anything all different. I mean, they could be walking, and you suggest, hey, you ever thought about that wheel thing? Rolls along nice and smooth, but you go faster. Well, it's not the way we've always done it. Oh, just, I know, sometimes I'm, I'm a little resistant to change myself. We all are. That's, that's part of our fallen sinful nature. But, man, you know, that's the way Israel was. Like, they don't even consider They just cling to what they've always done. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. We'll get into our passage this morning. Paul says, brethren, again, remember, he's, he's addressing a mostly Gentile church in Rome. He's addressing believers, but he's explaining to them about Israel. And he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, there are a few things that, that we need to see here, but let's, let's just start with verse 1. Verse 1 is kind of a little standalone, and it's just giving us Another glimpse of Paul's burden for Israel, Paul's heart. Paul started this in Romans chapter 9 and verses 2 and 3. Paul said that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. It's one of those, those great, we would say paradoxes, of being a faithful, a mature Christian. So we can have love, joy, peace through the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. If Paul had that, Paul would have had joy that probably most of us haven't even come close to yet because of our immaturity. Because we haven't truly learned to, to be content in all things, to, to walk after the Spirit. But at the same time, even though Paul had joy, he had heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart because he was burdened. Verse 3, he says, For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And it goes on to, to describe Israel. Paul there in, in Romans chapter 9 is saying, If it were possible... I would wish that I could go to hell in their place. And now in Romans 9, 2 through 3, Paul is, is showing the depth of his love for Israel. And or I'm sorry, in, in 9, 2 through 3, he's showing the depth of his love. For he's willing to sacrifice himself, not just his physical life, but he would be, if it were possible, willing to sacrifice his eternity. But now in, in 10 1, we see Paul's desire for Israel. But it's important that, that the Romans got this, and it's important that we get this. Y'all, there's, there's a danger among Christians to harbor bitterness against Israel for crucifying and rejecting Christ. And in our circles, you don't hear this, but you will hear this from Christians that basically say anytime Israel is going through a hardship, well, they're getting what they deserve. They rejected Jesus. They killed Jesus. They deserve it. Well, here's the thing. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
we all deserve the absolute worst, not just Israel. How many times in our heart, it was our sin, it was my sin that put Jesus on that cross. It wasn't just Israel. And, and don't get me wrong, those that, that crucified Christ without, without ever seeking forgiveness afterwards, those that have rejected Jesus throughout the church age, they will suffer the wrath of God. But what we can't miss is that God's heart is always for reconciliation. If they would just repent, if they would just turn back to God, that's what Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost is all about. Peter is preaching to the nation of Israel saying, yo, we got a big problem. You know that Messiah that y'all been looking for? Well, he came and you crucified him. And it's the message of how to how to recover from that, how to repent and, and receive forgiveness for that. God's desire for Israel is not that they be punished. Now I look around the room and there's a lot of parents in here. We don't desire to punish our kids, no matter what why it takes sometimes. We don't get pleasure from them. Our desire is that God's desire for Israel is that they come to faith and that they be restored and they be blessed. And of course, today we're, we're talking about Israel as a group of people collectively, corporately. And, and though the through the Bible, God does deal with some Jews individually, but when we're talking about Israel, it's corporately. The praise the Lord, not, not every individual Jew rejects Jesus Christ, but the majority of the leadership and the people do. So what we see here in Romans 9, 1 is Paul's heart for the Jews. And you have to keep in mind that the Jews are Paul's people group. They are his, his brethren in the flesh, but they have rejected the Lord. they rejected Paul's master, Jesus Christ. And at the point Romans is written, the Jews, Paul's people, God's chosen people, they've already beaten Paul multiple times. They've stoned him. They've imprisoned him. They've, they've caused him to flee from one city to the next. They've persecuted him immensely. Yo, Paul has every, every reason to be bitter and hateful toward the Jews. But, man, like, and, and no one can wound us like those closest to us. Those that we identify as our people. We had a student here one time, and I, an international student, and the student was was moving, and no one from that country. They they were very tied to their country, to the people from their country, but no one from that country helped. We were the only ones. And I I remember the impact, like the hurt, the disappointment. My people abandoned me. We expect it from others, but not from those closest to us. So Paul. Not only, not only did they do so many things to him, but it was his own people. But Paul's, Paul's heart's desire is for them to get saved because Paul's heart is aligned with God's heart. You know, can I just tell you, as a church, as individuals, our heart has to become aligned with God's heart. That has to be first and foremost. We, we talk so much about 2 Peter chapter 1. And there's that list. And in churches like ours, there's a temptation to say, add to your faith knowledge. 
is we place such a high emphasis on studying the word of God and rightfully so, but it's add to your faith virtue. Virtue is just submitting to what you already know. Gaining virtue is a process of gaining God's heart, of aligning our heart with God's heart, that whatever God says, that's what I will do, not out of a follow the rules mentality, but out of a he is the master I am the servant. He is worthy of it all. And my desire, my heart's desire, is for Christ's kingdom glory. And so when our heart is aligned with God's heart, then there has to be, there's this overwhelming desire to see those around us and those around the world reconciled to God by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even those that oppose themselves. We just saw on the screen, James and Rosie flying from Nairobi, Kenya. That's a long airplane. Trip. That's not an easy trip. We're Americans. We're lay out of seeings. Here in Laramie, tourist season is starting. What do Americans do in the summertime? The kids are out of school. We go on vacation. But we go to the places that please the flesh. We don't pick up and go somewhere to the other side of the world and sacrifice our entire summer vacation because souls matter. But that's God's fault. And that's the heart of a faithful disciple. And that's the heart that we have to have. Even to those that oppose themselves. And Israel definitely opposes themselves in the church age. Zealously even. You know, it, it's interesting that Paul tells us that the problem isn't a lack of drive. It, it's not that they're lukewarm toward God like we are in the Laodicean church age. We are the, the epitome of lazy as Christians. As Kenny Morgan says, we, we worship at the altar of comfort and convenience. And, like, it's mind-blowing. But that's not the problem here. It's not that they're, they're lukewarm toward God. They're actually zealous toward God. The problem is the source of their zeal. What they place their faith in is wrong. And we see in verse 2 that their zeal is not according to knowledge. The problem is that they know a lot about God. They know the Old Testament, including the law of Moses, very well, but they don't really know God because their faith is not in the God of the Word through the Word of God. They know the Word, but they don't know the God of the Word. Their faith is in their system of works that they've added to the law to give them righteousness. They've taken... They've taken the law out of context. They've added to it. They've twisted it. Now, now we have Mark chapter 7, verses 4 through 13. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold is the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why walk not thy disciples according to the, the word of God? No. The tradition of the elders. They're more concerned about man's tradition. But, bread with, but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Albeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. 
And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things ye do. So we see here in this passage that the Jews proclaim to follow God. And they they follow their religious system zealously. Paul is a great example of this. Paul, when he was Saul, before he came to faith in Christ, man, this dude was all in. I mean, I don't know why in my mind, it's always this picture of like, this cartoon thing where you got the map and you got you got one set of folks and they're kind of going along. And then you got the other ones coming behind chasing them. Paul was like that. Like the Christians are fleeing and Paul is chasing them. And he's this little, in my mind, he's this little angry dude. And he's always on this horse, like this big horse and this little tiny angry dude. He's, you know, he's going after him. Paul's Paul's testimony is he persecuted the church unto death. He's, he's bringing them into prison. He's testifying against them. Paul was zealous. But he was zealous for the wrong things, not of God. He, he claimed that he was zealous for God, but not according to faith, but according to the works of the law. So the Jews had basically taken the law of Moses out of context, twisted it, and added to it, and now the purpose of the law for them was, was to make them righteous. But that's not the reason that God gave Israel the law. So the purpose of the law is not to make man righteous. It was to show how sinful we really are. So in Romans chapter 7 and verse 13, it shows us that, it says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. See, the, the law, like all of God's word, is perfect and pure and holy. And in our flesh, we are far from any of that. So it's, it's not possible for man to live up to that standard of God's holy law. But by measuring ourselves against the holy word of God, it reveals to us just how wicked and unrighteous we are. And it shows our need for God's righteousness. Well, think, of, think of the Apostle John. John lived longer physically than any of the other, other apostles. During Jesus' earthly ministry, out of the 12, John was the only one that's faithful to go all the way to the foot of the cross. John is the apostle whom Jesus loved. John is the one that the night before the crucifixion is, is leaning on Jesus' breast, hearing the very heartbeat of God. Like It's kind of hard to get more spiritual than John. Paul is, is about that same far, but John... John had the, the privilege and the blessing of writing the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation that gives us the, the entire wrap-up of how Christ is going to return. And yet, all of that, when John comes face-to-face -face with Jesus Christ in the third heaven in his glorified form, John falls flat on his face. When we come face to face with God's righteousness, when we come to the word of God, and when Israel came to the law, if they were coming with the right heart, 
not looking to prove their righteousness, what they would have seen is how unrighteous they were. And it would show us our need for God's righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, 22 through 25 says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them to believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, the, the Galatians are a little bit different than the Jews. They, the Galatians are a Gentile church, and they had the problem that they had believed on Christ for eternal salvation. But then instead of continuing to rely on Christ's righteousness after salvation, they started trying to follow the law to make them righteous. The Jews, though, they, they were placing their eternity on the law. But instead of seeing their own sinfulness through the law, which would have driven them to seek God, to seek his righteousness, because they would have realized that there is no way. I am so messed up. The problem was that in setting up their religious system, well, they've basically taken God out of his word. And they've replaced him with their religious traditions. So the standard was no longer holy. The standard was no longer pure. The standard, the, the, the righteous and holy law, no longer convicted them. Now the bar was within reach of filthy, sinful man. And when the bar was still too high, well, they just, they just lowered it a little more by creating exceptions and loopholes to the law. They knew about God. But they didn't truly know God. And because they didn't know God, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And this continues to this day for Israel. But it isn't just Israel that falls into the trap during the church age of being ignorant of God's righteousness and trying to establish their own righteousness. You know, we're not in the Bible, though. We still have a lot of churches in town. You can drive around. And probably three quarters of the churches, there, there's a long list of various groups that ignore the righteousness of God and try to establish their own righteousness through their particular system of works. They're not following, well, some are trying to keep the mosaic law. They, they pick and choose, which doesn't make any sense to me. But they have their some system of works. I know we often look at the Catholic Church, and that is certainly an example, but there are so many more. And they're trying to establish their own righteousness through their own system of works. And, and y'all, many of them are very zealous. Like, that should break us. That these people that are, that are so desperately trying to establish their own righteousness, and yet we're content to sit back. They're working really hard trying to get to heaven. When your attorney is on the line, I suppose that's a powerful motivator. It'll make you work really hard. But they can never get there. They're like that hamster on a wheel. And they can never have peace. This kind of came up Friday night for Bible study. If you're in a system of works, you can never have peace. Because you never know, have I done enough? Praise the Lord that we have the righteousness of God and we can rest in that. We can have peace in that. But no matter how hard they try to work, we can never do enough. As Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousness is your filthy rags. It can never cover our sins 
let alone remove it and make us whole. And the heartbreaking truth for those that fall into that trap, illustrated by Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Notice they're not denying him. They're not, they're recognizing him. Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? <laughs> in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. It certainly sounds zealous to me. But here's the problem. Verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. God's righteousness that we receive by faith in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. His burial and his resurrection is the only way to salvation. We can, we can believe that there is a God. And we can be very zealous in doing things for God. We can even know the word of God. There are a lot of people out there, y'all, that are going to bust hell wide open. And they have a whole lot more Bible memorized than I probably ever will. But they're relying on things like that, on their works, to make them acceptable to God. And it can never be enough. If you're here this morning and you placed your faith in Christ for eternal life, man, hallelujah. That, that's the only way that we can have eternal life. But for us, we do need to talk about, there's a danger that you could lose not your salvation, but your rewards at the judgment seat. Because after salvation, there's the danger you can slip, just like the Galatians, you can slip into relying on your own righteousness to please God. Paul warns in Colossians 2.8 to, to beware lest, lest they be spoiled after the rudiments of the world, after the traditions of men. Tradition is an easy trap to fall into. It's comforting and appealing to our flesh. It appeals to our desire to go along with the mainstream. You know, and for us, a lot of times, I think we see traditions as the very liturgical, the very stiff, the formal, the, the high church, the, the things that are sort of coming out of Catholicism or um, here where we're at, where there's a lot of uh, Mormon influence and there's a lot of rigidity. And we, we sort of see that as the traditions of men. But you know, I mean, if we're just totally... If we're totally transparent and totally honest with ourselves, in churches like ours, Bible study can become a tradition. Discipleship can become a tradition. All those good and right and spiritual and biblical things that we do, there was nothing wrong with the law. It wasn't the law that was the problem. It was the Jews' heart. So we have to be careful that we don't have the wrong heart when we come to those things. And the way we counteract the tradition is to make the word of God our final authority, not those tradition, those things that we do don't become our tradition or our authority and our, our source of righteousness. The difference is all in the heart. It has to begin with worship. Where we bow down before God in our heart and we praise him. We worship him for his holiness, for his righteousness. We have to know the word of God and know the God of the world. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you again this morning, Lord, grateful and thankful. 
God, that you've given us the incredible gift of your word. God, my prayer this morning is that that we don't take that for granted. Lord, that we don't treat it as any other book. Lord, that we don't treat gaining knowledge with righteousness. We don't try to make those synonymous. Lord, that we don't skip virtue. That we don't just add to our faith knowledge. Lord, that we don't become puffed up and we don't become prideful. And Lord, we don't become complacent in doing all the spiritual things. And we don't become so busy with the work of the ministry that the, the busyness of life overwhelms the business of life for a Christian. Lord, that we, we remember first and foremost, like Mary, that we are to sit at your feet, just worship you, Lord. We remember that first and foremost, we were created for your glory, to worship you. And Lord, I pray that rather than trying to seek our own righteousness through doing all the spiritual things, God, we would just fully surrender ourselves to you and to your righteousness and trust that if we do that, Lord, you will work through us and you will use us for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.